Good morning to each of you. Along with announcements made, we welcome each of you into our assembly. Thankful for the opportunity the Lord has granted that we could be here on this Lord's Day. If you have your Bible this morning, if you'll turn with me to 2 Corinthians in the 5th chapter, I want to read one verse to start our study. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and if you will, look with me at verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all die. I would that you look at the very beginning of that verse and notice the statement made by the beloved Paul when he said, For the love of Christ compels us. And I want to begin by asking several questions this morning. What can one do when they feel discouraged with the difficulties and troubles in life? When life seems to be overwhelming with problems, just what can one do? And what can we do as a local church when the church isn't growing in spirit and truth or in number? And many times you look around and it seems like the church may be on the decline. And what can we do when we feel downhearted because some do not act interested? You preach or you teach and you encourage and yet some do not seem willing to step up. Then you fear they're not growing in Christ and we know that if one's not growing, then one is on the decline. Then I've often thought about what do you do when you have all the issues that you face in life? I think the words of Paul that we just read are very important to help us when we feel frustrated, overwhelmed, or burned out. And there are two very important words I want to talk about that I believe really make a difference in the life of a child of God. In fact, the business, I dare say, it would be an overestimate to say that most ailments and troubles within the church today can be traced to the absence of lack of this one thing. And that's the word that Paul talked about and I challenge to put into place at this time, love. And what I want to talk about this morning is try love. Just use those two words. While faith makes all things possible, love makes all things easy or at least more easy. And here are some thoughts upon Christian love I want us to think about. First of all, I want us to think about how love begins. And one thing is certain about love, and that is love cannot be worked up. In fact, the New Testament writers acknowledge two aspects of love that I want us to talk about. First of all, look at the gift of love. Love is a choice, and love is a gift. Take your Bible and look in the Roman letter and the fifth chapter. And when you look in the Roman letter and the fifth chapter, you'll take note that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome. And notice what he says in verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I want you to think about the love of God for just a moment. And notice that love comes with life. Just as eternal life is a gift, so is the love which is inseparable from life. Just a moment ago, you'll remember that David read from Romans chapter 6. And he read verses 3 and 4 where we talked about newness of life. We talked about one being baptized into Christ. They're raised up in newness of life. But that newness of life equals a new love. Now God is my focus. Christ is my first love. Sometimes I know someone will talk about their spouse as their main love or first love. I'll tell you, your spouse is not your first love. Jesus Christ should be your first love. And I'll tell you the day that Jesus Christ is not your first love, Jesus Christ is not in the proper place. The day that we love someone or something more than Jesus Christ, whether it be a family member, whether it be an object, whatever it may be, then you have taken Jesus off his throne and his rightful place. So when I was baptized into Christ, I walked in newness of life, but I also had a new love, a new first love. It's no longer myself. It's no longer my desire. It's no longer my will, but I have subjected myself willingly to the will of God. And I want you to think about that we love. Now take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 3 for just a moment. And when you come to 1 John chapter 3, look at what G, uh, John had to say in verse 14. We know, now I like that. 
You know, there's some things that I just want to know. And here's something that I can know. I don't have to guess. I don't have to surmise. John said, this is something you can mark down. We know that we have passed from death to life. Now, John, how do I know that? How do I know that I'm no longer spiritually separated from God, that I am now in Christ? He said, because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Now, so not only do I have love for Christ, number one, I'm to have love for the brethren. And he said, because we love, we love the word of God. We love the house of God. We love the will of God. We love the people of God. We love God himself most of all. Because all are loved, we now have a new purpose in life. In your Bible, in Romans chapter 6, in verse 23, you remember that the Apostle Paul was writing, and he said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, I like that. Life is a gift, but so is love. Love is something that we bestow upon someone willingly, and we receive it willingly. If we do not receive it and we do not bestow it, then my friend, we have not done what God has told us to do as we walk in newness of life. Take your Bible for just a moment and look in the book of 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, when John is speaking, notice what again, what he says in verse 16. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want us to think about that kind of love between brother and sister in Christ. I'll tell you what I think one thing that is lacking in the church of my Lord today is true love for one another. You know why I believe that? Because sometimes there will be a brother or sister that's missing. And between all of us together, someone should notice it. And sometimes we say, well, the elders need to notice it and the preacher needs to notice it. But we need to work together if we love one another. And if someone's missing, we're concerned about that. If you're in the army and one soldier's missing, you don't just go on. You want to go back and see if that soldier's down. And if that soldier's down, you're going to help him up. And sometimes in the church of my Lord, we leave the wounded behind. They're the ones that need the help. And if I have love, I'm concerned about their soul. I'm not going to condone their sin. I'm not going to accept their sin. But what I'm going to do is work with them and they're going to work with me so that we show love towards one another and ultimately love towards our Father. And thus we are doing what God has commanded us to do. So we help one another to heaven. Have you ever thought that's so important? But I want you to think about what Jesus said in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'll tell you sometimes we've quoted that so much we just miss the power of that statement. How many of you would just sacrifice your child for someone else? And yet God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. So there is how love begins, the gift of love. But secondly, there's the growth of love. Love doesn't stay stagnant. Love either grows or it dies. Now, you know, it's interesting to me that many times we don't see what we need to do is abound in love. Take your Bible and look in the book of Philippians in the first chapter for just a moment. And when you come to Philippians chapter 1, look at what Paul says in verse 9. And just read the first part. And this I pray. Now, Paul, what's your prayer? You're praying for the church at Philippi. And perhaps you need to be praying for the church at O'Neill. What would your prayer be? That your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Look at that. Your love may abound. Underscore that. That is so important. Now, Paul says, my prayer to the church at Philippi is that your love for one another may abound. You know, it's interesting. Let's take that a step. We're told and instructed to love our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. We're commanded to love those that hate us and mistreat us. But that kind of love we need to develop is that we are te wanting them to go to heaven even if they don't love us in return. See, love doesn't have to be too... We can love someone and they not love us back. And Jesus said, those who mistreat you, you do not return mistreatment. You try to help them to go to heaven. 
You love your enemies. Now that's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. That's a choice. You choose to do good to those who do wicked to you. But I want us to think about something else. There's a kind of love we need to develop that we know. And the mistake that so many Christians make, they're trying to love a God they don't know. I feel sorry for someone who does not know God. They're trying to serve a God they have no knowledge about. And the reason they don't know Him in due part is because they seldom spare time to read His Word and to bend their knees in prayer and to bend their will to His. You don't love someone fully till you know them. And the important thing we need to do is get to know God better and get to know one another better. Now, Paul's prayer in Philippians 3.10 is that I might know Him. So I see love for God, number one. And I see love for my brother, number two. And that, my friend, is how love begins. But now, just secondly, what love becomes. And there are two things that love becomes. There are more, but we're just going to consider two. First of all, love becomes the motive of our service. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14. Paul, what motivated you? And Paul would say, the love of God constrained me. It compelled me. It made me. And notice, my friend, this is tireless in the spending of its strength and also thoughtful in its inside of others' needs. Paul said, I am going to be the kind of person that looks out and sees the needs of others, their spiritual needs, and I'm going to help them. You think about that job as a brother and sister in Christ, and you compare it to a mother's task. What is a mother's task? To love her child. And what's more fulfilling than that? Well, I'll tell you, when we love one another and we love our God, we all need to be people of love. And I think that's what's needed. When love motivates you, then pride is stripped away. And when pride is stripped away, envy is stripped away. And when pride and envy are taken away, then God's commandments are seen to help us and help us maintain our joy and not restrict our joy. And worship is not seen as an obligation to just get through, but it's seen as a privilege. Giving is not done grudgingly, it's done willingly. When I love, I motivate from a different aspect than when I'm motivated by fear. Now here's what I think. I think there are a lot of people that fear hell. And because they fear hell, they want to do just enough to avoid it. But the problem is they don't love God. They just fear hell. Now, I think fear is a good motivation. I don't want to go to hell. I'm fearful of going to hell. But I'll tell you what's a better motivation. I love God. And love becomes the measure of our surrender. Love is a glad giver. In Romans 6, 13, when Paul commands us, yield yourself to God, it's not the submission of love to the threat of Jesus being a tyrant, but he has in mind it's a glad surrender of love because God first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. In Romans 5, 6, God demonstrated that love by the giving of his son. God said, not only did I tell you I loved you, I showed you I loved you. That brings up something else. How do you show your love to God? You know, the problem with so many days, that, not that we don't love God, is that we don't love God enough. That God is not the center of our life. God is on the plate, but He's just a part of the plate. He's just a piece of the pie. He's not the center of our life. And when God's not the center of our life, God again is out of place. You want to see how important this is? I'll tell you what you do sometime. If you want to see how popular a church is, come on Sunday morning. You want to see how popular a preacher is or someone else is, come on Sunday night. If you want to see how popular Jesus is, come on Wednesday night and you'll see. And I'll tell you something. I'm fearful. And I realize some work, and I'm not condemning that, but I'll tell you what I do fear. That sometimes we want to do just as little as possible to say that we are a Christian. But I want you to know, my friend, God knows your heart if you love Him or not. 
God knows if you are concerned about doing his will. And I'll tell you something, and maybe I shouldn't feel this way, but I do. When I see the Sunday night and Wednesday night numbers, I just get a little bit discouraged. I just get a little bit down. Because I sometimes wonder if we just think all I got to do is check one hour off the box and say, now, Lord, I've done something. My friend, have you thought about the people in Africa who are going day in and day out without food and they're preaching the gospel and they're teaching it and they do it with joy? I was talking to a fellow one time who said that they went to preach and they couldn't get enough of preaching. And I thought, well, brother, I don't understand that. Now, he must have been talented. I'd heard about a fellow one time that went to Korea and was preaching. And it started raining and the people continued to sit there and it got about midnight and he and his friend were tired and they left and they came back down and the people were still standing there and they said, what are you doing here? And they said, how can we leave when you told us about this Jesus? We want to know more. And then we come in and complain that the padded pew's not feeling good enough. I'll tell you, sometimes we've been so spoiled, we don't think we need God. And we've got in our mind that God's lucky to have us, when in reality, we're lucky that God has even spared us to this point. God doesn't owe you one thing, my friend. You owe everything to God. And the day you feel entitled that God owes you something, and that God should just be thankful you're a part of His church, and that you're going to do the bare minimum, you have totally misunderstood the love of God for you and the love you should have for Him. Now I'll tell you, a great measure of love is seen in how much time you want to spend with someone. When you first started dating, you couldn't spend enough time with the one you married, could you? i tell you what I did. In college, I took a class called Major Figures of English Literature just so I could sit in the class with Mary. I had no business in that class. I didn't know what they were talking about. The teacher said, Mike, what do you think that fellow said? I said, he's probably on opium. He don't know what he was saying. And she said, well, that might be true. And went on. I didn't know what the answer was. But I wanted to be near her. Now, you think about that spiritually. We should think about being close to God. We should want to come to worship. But thirdly, we see how love begins and what love becomes. I want you to think thirdly, how love behaves. The New Testament is practical books. And while it's put its doctrine first and rightly so, it never fails to put into practice what it teaches. I want you to think about love will have a standard of behavior. Look in 1 Corinthians 13. And look at the standard of behavior. And this we've read so many times. Paul had talked about spiritual gifts. In chapter 12, he said the gift of prophecy will be done away with. He said the gift of tongues will be done away with. The gift of interpretation will be done away with. He said, but there's one gift that will never be done away with and even not even done away with in our day, and that's love. Look at what he says beginning in verse 4 of chapter 13. Love suffers long. That's love. Love is kind. I like that statement. I'll tell you, we don't know what other people are going through. And sometimes all they need is a little kindness. Sometimes I've seen people just be so down in the mouth and they're grouchy. And you show them a little bit of kindness and it seems like it turns them around. They start to smile a bit. You don't know what they've been through that day. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. I don't have to brag about my love. People should see my love. It does not behave rudely. Oh, I would I could get my brethren to believe that. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Look at that statement. Do you think the worst of everybody? Do you think everybody's just out here doing... Do you, how, what do you think of others? It does not rejoice in iniquity. I'll tell you, that's something that really bothers me. When someone sins, some people almost seem excited to hear it. Why is it gossip can get around the world before the gospel can get its shoes on? But not only that, it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. Then drop down to verse 13. 
And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Paul said in the first two verses, if I am able to distinguish tongues, but I do not have love, he said, I become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And then he said, if I can understand prophecy and all the mysteries, but I don't have love, he said, I am nothing. Love is what motivates you. But that brings up another thought. Not only is it its standard, but it should be what we're known by. In your Bible in John 14, remember verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now how do I know if I love God? I keep his commandments. Which ones? The ones I want? The ones I pick? No, I keep the ones, every one of them that he's told me. But notice something else. Look in John 13 for just a moment. And this is a powerful statement in John 13. Look at what he says in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, you won't have to explain to others you're a Christian. They will know it without being told when they see our love for God and for one another. And I tell you, sometimes I think our lack of love may be showing. I don't say any of this to hurt anyone, but what I'm trying to get us is, is motivated to have love for God. And I wish I could say it the way that I had in my mind and in my heart, and I wish that you would receive it with the intent that it was in purpose, that we would be motivated to love God first and foremost and love one another. Because I want to tell you, without love, you're nothing. If you just love yourself, that's selfish. But if I love God and I love others, I'm going to put their thoughts and their needs above my own to help them get to heaven. A good friend of mine passed away. D. Bowman. I was down to see Dee just before he died, but I was only able to talk through him through Zoom. And Dee used to have a saying. Dee would say, if you've missed heaven, you've just missed all there is. I want to tell you, that's exactly right. And you will miss heaven if you don't love God and you don't love your brethren. I'll never forget one time preaching with anger and Robert Jackson taking me aside and said, Son, you can't preach with anger. you got to preach with love. When you're mad, put that sermon away. I said, that's when I want to preach it. And he said, I know, but that's not the time to preach it. Preach something else. And I'll tell you, that's exactly right. I need to preach out of love. And we need to learn to love one another. Oh, if you love God and you've never been baptized, today would be the day to rejoice and be immersed into Christ and have every sin blotted out. Or if you've left your first love, which is Christ, and you need to be restored. We pray you come as together we stand and sing.